I am Mufasa, and uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. I think everybody knows me because I spoke last night. <laughs> but um, I am Mufasa, and I'm in uh, Chicago, and one of the founding fathers of the visionary of Onyx, and the founding, one of the founding fathers of Onyx. <coughs> And uh, we now have nine chapters yes. across the United States. Um, our, the Onyx Pearls are joining us, which are our sister, which is a sister organization um, alongside Onyx, and they currently have three chapters uh, with one in formation. Um, and so, uh, if you're interested in any of membership in any of the chapters or um, any of the of the chapters in your area that you'd like to collaborate with and do things with please see any of us uh, the chapters are located in new york that's northeast then we move down to mid-atlantic uh, which is headquartered in dc southeast headquartered in atlanta uh, deep south which is headquartered in fort lauderdale um, then we move to uh, Midwest, which is headquartered in Chicago. We have Great Lakes in Detroit and Cleveland. We have Southeast in LA area. Southwest, Southwest. Southwest, Southwest. I'm sorry. In LA area, I skipped over Lone Star, Lone Star which is Dallas and Houston um, area. And then Northwest, San, uh, San Francisco area. What is that? <laughs> oh, that was an expression, a freeform expression of happiness. Right. <laughs> is that what they're calling it? Well, crazy. that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> and the Pearl chapters are in New York, Northeast, Mid Atlantic, DC, and Southeast. Um, uh, Southeast, Atlanta, and um, in formation, Deep South, Fort Lauderdale. So, um, thank you for being here. I will have the panelists introduce themselves, um, and uh, then we can jump into the questions that we have for the panels. For the panel, basically, intersectionality is um, a term. It's it's the big buzzword of the moment. Um, we hear it all over the place, and it basically is talking about that I bring all of me to the table. And how do you interact with me knowing that I bring myself as a black man, I bring myself as a leather man, I bring myself as a father, I bring myself as a Christian, a progressive Christian, I bring myself to the table as a six foot one man. So height and weight accordingly. Um, I bring myself to the table as an East Coast pers person who grew up on the East Coast in New Jersey, but live in Chicago. So I bring that to the table, um, those sensibilities. I bring my age to the table. I bring my, you know, my color to the table. If I'm in the black community, we heard about some of that last night. Um, so I bring a lot of things to the table, but I am all of those things. And how does, how do we intersect when we're at an event or we're at a meeting or we're at dealing with one another, one another based on those politics as well. And if I had military experience, that would be in there as well. I do, I do not, but some people do, many people do. So those are, where do we cross? How do we cross? How do we deal with that? And in this case, we're talking about um, the intersectionality and politics within the leather community and racism within the community. And so those are the topics that are on the table today. We could have a number of different topics on the table um, dealing with this issue but we are looking at those types of topics in the leather community today. So I'll have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, I thank them for being here and giving of their time and their talent um, to the panel. And I'll have each of them introduce themselves, who they are, where they're from, um, and their uh, place in our community. Why don't we start with uh, Ben Rock. <laughs> I am Daddy Rod. I currently live here in the Atlanta area. I'm from San Jose, California. Uh, been in the leather community now going on almost 20 years. Onyx member 16 years. Uh, I've been every officer in our chapter. 
every officer. <laughs> so now that I'm not an officer anymore, <laughs> and, uh, I'm also the national treasurer for Onyx, and also the first African American Mr. Atlanta Eagle, 2016. And my Sash daughter, Dale, Miss Atlanta Eagle, 2017. <laughs> and uh, so just glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dominion Onyx. I am currently the Pledge Master for Onyx Mid-Atlantic. I'm one of the founders of the chapter. I've been a member of Onyx since 2007. Uh, I've, before being the treasurer, I was the president for four years and, uh, excuse me, the president for four years and the treasurer for seven years uh, before that. I'm also on the National Council uh, and also on the board of uh, DC Leather Pride. And uh, I live in Washington, DC. And I have a, a radio show called the BGKA Show with Dominion and Epic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm EMR. I am currently the Sergeant at Arms for the Onyx Pearls Southeast Chapter for the second year in a row. Um, I am originally from Southeast Pennsylvania and now live currently in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm also a part of the Primal community and organize many things for our Primal events. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Madam Battle Raven. Um, I've been a member of Onyx Pearl Southeast since 2017. I am currently the nonprofit committee chair. And as far as my time in leather, it hasn't been that long. I am still a baby. Um, I'm originally from Queens, New York. I'm an army brat, so I moved around a lot. And now I live in the Middle Tennessee area, not too far from EMR. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Graylin Thornton. I am a member of the brand new Onyx chapter from San Francisco. They call us Northwest, but we know where we are. <laughs> <laughs> I have wanted that since you and I met back in the day, and he went all around <laughs> the U.S. before <laughs> coming back to San Francisco. It could just gone that away. But we're there. But, but we're there. We're there. Uh, and I'm very happy about that. I was uh, Mr. Drummer, International Mr. Drummer in 1993. Mm -hmm. So I'm old. Um, <laughs> and I feel it. Uh, been around a while um, with my chapter. I'm kind of like the guy who sits on the porch in the rocking chair, and I let the kids do all their things, and they're, they're wonderful. So uh, I'm happy to be there. I'm happy that the chapter is formed now. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Merlin Onyx. Um, well, let's see. I am very new to leather and to Onyx. I crossed in July of last year, and in August of last year, I was voted in as vice president. <laughs> so, one, wonderful job. So, it officially took post in January of this year, so I'm very new um, to the leather lifestyle. But um, it definitely feels more like home than a lot of things that I've um, tried to be a part of previously, of being black and gay. So, um, yeah, that's me. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Rick Morris. I currently live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, I was uh, Mr. Connecticut Leather 1997, Mr. Connecticut Drummer 1997, and Mr. Ebony Leather 2000. Uh, Mufas and I were IML brothers from 97 when I found out about Onyx and immediately rushed back to Atlanta. Five brothers who founded the South East chapter of Onyx. Next year will be our 20th year as a chapter in the uh, Southeast. Um, coming back and forth through uh, from Chattanooga to Atlanta now more frequently because I was voted uh, as president of the Southeast chapter uh, this past year. So I'm enjoying that uh, position somewhat. <laughs> it has its challenges, but it also has a lot of reward, which is uh, which is outweigh the challenges. So. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. 
to our panel. I thank them to our interpreters. I thank them for being here with us. Um, and I thank you all for being here and taking your time out this afternoon while we're here. So let's jump into the questions um, that we have because we have some questions that were pre-prepared and we then uh, can get to comments and questions from the audience uh, as we see fit. Let me pull them up as we have them here somewhere. <coughs> there we are. The first question I want to pose to the panel is how can non people of color organizations support people of color organizations and their efforts within the community? So that's the first question. How can non people of color organizations support people of color organizations and their efforts within the leather community? Anybody want to take a stab at that first? Sure. Dominion? <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer to that question is that they can help us by respecting our mission and treating us as equals. So one of the issues that we have to address frequently in DC or in the Mid-Atlantic is that people will come to us and ask us to participate, but they want us to be the security or they uh, want us to just do the boots to balls. And one, I don't, I, 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 I don't get down on the ground. So, so I personally don't do that, and that is not the chapter that I that I founded. That is not what we're here for. It's fine if we're doing security this year and someone else is doing it, but that is not the entirety of our role. We founded, you founded this organization. I helped found this chapter because we are a collection of kinky people who want to educate, explore, and empower not answer the door, not do that kind of thing. So for me, that is how uh, they can do that, is by respecting our mission and respecting that we are equally as qualified to do so. Now, when I say respect, it's not that I'm asking for anything because I'm not asking you to do anything. All I'm asking you really to do is to get out of my way. So uh, that really is a, a better summary of it, is to get out of our way. Thank you. Anybody else? on the panel. <coughs> Rock? One, I would say, first come to our events. Because for some reason, and I, I speak on Blackout. We had Blackout in New Orleans. In New Orleans last September. Which is the annual, which is the <coughs> biannual bi 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 no, semi bi Semi-biannual. Semi-biannual. Of Onyx. And the issue, I, we, I, we continually have, and I, I maybe the other chapters can voice their concerns or their uh, their concerns about this is they see honest and they think it's just only for people of color. Like we got some like maybe there's some visible link saying only people of color can only the color folks should show up. So I have non people of color say, well can I come? And I'm like of course you can come. I was like, does it say no whites? Does it say no Asians? I said of course you can come. Then they feel like, well maybe I might not be wanted there. I'm like, that's not the case at all. So if you ever, if you've been to any honest events we're very welcoming. So it's first trying to break that kind of, I guess, that barrier. Mm -hmm. And then that can kind of somewhat start the conversation like, oh, you all are having a good time. We can, we can, we can conversate with you all. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I don't know. It's just that simple. Other thoughts? <clears throat> yes. Um, for me, it's the big part of allowing us to speak on our own behalf. A lot of times, organizations being helpful will have other people speak of our experiences, our problems within the community as if we do not have a voice or the capacity to speak for ourselves. So when you are doing those discussions on cultural sensitivity or how to integrate more people of color into your communities, making it welcoming, have us speak for ourselves because it's really demeaning sometimes of seeing a white person telling everybody else how I'm supposed to feel. Comment, question? Can I piggyback off of that and sort of add to the question? Sure. 
Do you have any, and I don't know if it's a future question, but I'm sorry if it is, do you have any suggestions of how to help integrate and get people involved with groups in the community? Because the community I'm in, we don't have a very active amount of people in the culture. And how about you? To see that integration. As you can see, there's a lot of Onyx members here from Onyx Men and Onyx Pearls. Ask us to show up. So that way the people of color in your community will see others and see that there are organizations that are going to be welcoming because on the also on the other side, for people of color, we hear it of people saying, black people don't do these things. But if they see us there, then they're going to go, oh, I can be a part of this. And at the same time, Please do not treat us like we're Pokemon. Don't. We are not rare Pokemon. This is not the Johto. This is not the Johto region, and you're not Ash Ketchum. Just invite us. You know, let us come hang out. We'll we'll invite y'all over. Y'all can hang out. But please don't go home and just be like, so. At my event, we had a black person, and we had this, and we had that, and. Yes, all the boxes are ticked. Yay! Yes. And I know that sounds really sarcastic, but so understand that a lot of us, we treat these kind of situations with humor. And I'm one of those people that treat that kind of situation with humor. Can I just add sure. one thing that, although um, even within Onyx, we are not struggling, but we are we are championing increased diversity because everyone here, I think, identifies as African American, but particularly our chapters on the West Coast are a lot more diverse and have more people of Asian descent and also have people of Latino descent. So this conversation, I think I want to be clear, while we will speak to some general people of uh, issues for people of color, I think it's going to be most specifically about African American experience, and there that experience is going to show up differently for our Latino brothers and sisters and for our Asian Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. Because I speak specifically because one of our brothers um, is Japanese, mm -hmm. and uh, in in D.C. is Japanese, and he spoke specifically about some challenges that he had growing up on the West Coast and some things that he experienced that, you know, we recognized as a commonality and experience of how he was treated in leather bars and things, but then he also spoke of some things that were specific to uh, his own particular ancestry. So again, this experience here is should only be taken, should really only be taken as our own experience, but if you're going to extrapolate it, it only extrapolates so far. Thank you. Any other? Um, so I would also say that um, it's important that NPOC advocate for us in spaces that we're not a part of, um, in private conversations and things that happen outside of our eyes, um, because Frankly, sometimes the conversations can get more racial in private and more, oh, that's just for black people or this, this is just a black person <clears throat> club. And it's important for um, the NPLC community to advocate for us and say, no, we're not, they're not just that organization. So I think that's also an important thing to add as well. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, <coughs> so NPLC, I, I know what it means, but white people is really what it means. Because that's the only group that is not of color when we're talking about it. And so I think a lot of times we just really need to call it what it actually is. We're, we're talking about white people and how we can treat it and continue to be treated and, and how we can have access. Um, I think obviously we gather together uh, in our clubs and groups because we have commonalities and that was that's what draws us to that. Uh, in the previous um, panel, for example, we were talking about old guard versus new guard. Um, I think there's an opportunity for uh, clubs to regulate and, and help, if that's concerned about old guard and new guard, bring people to a certain standards and protocol. I think that same thing exists when it comes to uh, white versus, in my experience, black. Um, I heard a lot of people say that they've been in leather for X number of years. I don't really know. I know showing up at the Eagle or showing up at, um, believe it or not, Bulldogs was a leather bar, probably my first leather bar, uh, as the only black person in that bar and not really 
uh, are looked at as some exotic um, person in terms of being black in you know, an all white leather bar. Um, I wanted to really piggyback on what Merlin had to say about it's what's said outside of public view that makes the biggest, the biggest difference and what you can do to help most is to make sure that you're not, as a white person, tolerating those types of languages and comments and criticisms and jokes. Uh, because you want to be a part of the group, you need to stand up and say, that's not correct, that's not right. To me, that will be the biggest help. Because if, they can, if others who do feel that way continue to see um, people that look like them, in this case white, saying something other than that, then that helps the entire community. For the vicious statement of Onyx, is there something that's in the verbiage that gives that sort of transparency to people who are not of color about inclusion and about, because speaking as a black gay man myself, I've always viewed the group sort of askew from like, oh, I don't know, I've, I've, I've never been sure if it was a self-segregating group or anything like that. I even had this mm -hmm. conversation last night. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what's the, uh, how, does that, how does that come across? Do you encounter that type of challenge a lot from even people of color not wanting to be a part of the group because they don't feel like they want to be segregated mm -hmm. from the larger group? Um, yes, we've gotten that question <laughs> from day one. Yeah. And we continue to get that question. Um, our there is in our bylaws, it brings it, it states that we bring and form together as like-minded individuals to deal with the issues that we face as gay and bi-spirited men of color. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. That's what yes. the bylaws say. <laughs> now, membership, if you ask anybody about membership in the organization. All people, there are levels of membership for all people in our organization. There is full brother membership, which you have to be a man of color. Um, uh, we have the associate membership, which is anyone can be an associate member, male, female, anyone can be an associate member of Onyx. And uh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. There are other levels within. Yeah, there's maybe some subsets. There are that subsets of that before members who become alumni members and yeah, yeah. those types of things. But anyone can be a <laughs> member. Um, a voting member, you have to be a full man of color um, to be a voting member in the organization. But any of the members can come to anything uh, that the organization sponsors, even meetings. And if you're an associate, um, the only thing that you are asked to step out of the room for is a, a discussion of the finances of the organization, um, which is a voting privilege of within the, the full brotherhood. But all of our events are open to all, and all of our events are advertised as such. Yes? Does it work the same with the pearls? For the pearls, it's a little bit different, which I was... Yeah, that's what we're just talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, for, for the Pearl Women, it, for full pledge members, you do have to be a woman of color, and it's regardless of what your sexual orientation is. Uh, but then we follow the same guidelines as our brothers for the associates and uh, onward down in regards that it can be anyone. So and we so, also accept men yeah. as our associates. The assumption is, and we the assumption that we um, uh, fight against, and actually that is the next question. <laughs> how apropos. <laughs> how apropos. The question is, how can POC organizations erase the stigma that they are biased and offensive in not allowing non-POCs to be full members? So that is a question that is always on the table. So we're not self-segregating, we're segregating in a way, we're not, we're, we're, we're gathering in a way that we, so that we can address the issues that are germane to us as people of color in the community and select things that are apropos for us to do in the community to further ourselves and the organization in the community. Case in point, um, and I think I mentioned this maybe last night at the late night uh, meeting, but um, when we formed in Chicago, it was in the, uh, the AIDS epidemic or pandemic 
was very prevalent, still is, but was very prevalent. And there were a number of minority organizations, um, HIV organizations in Chicago. The leather community has been at the forefront of supporting HIV, uh, HIV uh, issues and organizations uh, through the 80s, through the 90s as such. What we did not see was the leather, general leather community giving to the minority HIV organizations, which affected us because our friends were affected and infected and affected and some friends were dying. And that's where our, you know, our energy was going to. But we're also part of the community, the leather community, and we didn't see our community giving to those organizations. So we stepped in that gap and started fundraising and giving to those organizations, as well as having the first brick at the Leather Archives and Museum, as well as supporting the Green Room, the Jill Carter Green Room at the Leather Archives and Museum, which we are the caretakers of. So there's a both and <laughs> yes. that we needed to support these organizations and we still support said organizations today. And gay and lesbian youth, uh, homeless youth, which tend to be mostly people of color. So the <coughs> things that we choose as an organization and vote on to support are more in line with what we, um, what we encounter as people of color in and outside of the community. Um, I think the, you know, word choice is essential. Segregate means that, you know, you, are, you either choose to place yourself in a box or you are placed in a box and no one else is allowed in that box. So we have never said that we are placing ourselves in a box and we've certainly not been placed in a box by others. We've only chosen, chosen to freely associate because of some particular concerns that are um, important to us. And I think that um, in the same way that I have no problem with women choosing to gather uh, because there are concerns that are specific to humans that are females. We're human? I, you're human, yes. Oh. Women are humans. I know that I know that is a shock. I know that is a shock to some people. God is a shock. But I have no problem with that as a man in the same and so I would I would want other people not to have a problem with any group of humans choosing to gather with other like humans for reasons specific to them. And the reasons that you want to gather don't have to be explained to me. You don't owe me an explanation for why you choose to associate with one another. And I don't feel left out because you are choosing to have fun together and I guess maybe the only time that I would have an issue is if you purposely said to me in a negative way, no, you can't come in, which you've never done and which Onyx has never done. There's never been even a single uh, instance of us saying to anyone, you can't come in. They may have assumed that. So, and, and, and even other uh, people of color may have assumed that, um, oh, because my partner is not a person of color, that I can't come. Well, if you, you, you that was you. That's not us. And there's only so far we can go in um, helping that out. In the, in the founding of Onyx, of the five of us who sat at my dining room table, three of us, three of the individuals had partners who were non-people of color who were white. The question was put on the table as we're forming this organization because we, have to, we had to consider all of those types of things in coming and being open to the community and understanding that we did not want to be seen as segregationists <laughs> ourselves. So we looked at other organizations, Asians and Friends and Amigos Latinos in, in Chicago and other organizations to kind of get our, you know, where do we need to be and how do we need to form this? Their issue, I said, well, what will your partners feel if they cannot be full voting members of this organization? How will they feel? There, um, as we move forward, because we spent a year at my dining room table planning this 
and putting this together. Um, they said, this is not about them. This is about me, who I am. And it's open to them to come to everything that we do and support our, or this organization, but this organization is about the, the experience that I, as a man of color, have in my leather journey. It's not about other people in that sense. So those things were meticulously looked at as best we could and written into the bylaws as best we could as so that we did not become the oppressor. Right. Because if anybody reads our bylaws, it does. Right. That, it was, that was intentional, that we do not become the oppressors. Because when we looked at Asians and Friends in Chicago, we noticed that the Friends were running the organization. Not the Asians. <laughs> and that's an issue. <laughs> And we see that as a, we saw that as an issue, and we we worked meticulously to try to not be in that same vein. There's a hand at the table. I'm sorry. <clears throat> there were two hands at the table, sir. Oh, no. Sir Ra. Yes, I just wanted to address what you were saying earlier. How uh, people have not. Can you speak up? How people white whites would uh, integrate into say Onyx. Um, again, we've had blackout. We host events. And just like any other organizations that host events, we have opportunities for volunteers. We have opportunities for um, if they want to um, sell jello shots. But we don't get that. We are always asked to do it. But no one, I, what I've noticed is that that same opportunity is never um, brought back to us. This is really the same rhetoric that speaks about the first discrimination and the reason for affirmative action, that whole train of thought. And typically how I respond is that um, there is an affirmative action program for non-POCs, it's called America. Okay. The best reality is that when you have had systemic racial issues, that have created uh, economic disparity, education disparity, and a lot of the barriers to entry that leather POC have, just in terms of getting to conferences, you know, participating in events, holding space, having the credit to put down the down payment. When you when you factor in those things, we need to be self-advocating, and it's not exclusionary. It is self-advocating, and there is a difference. My self-advocating for leather POC does not demean you being a non-POC. It means that we have particular issues that we must highlight in order to continue to have um, equity. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to that point and to your 10, it has to be uh, from the black side too, uh, communicated in a way where it seems more inviting and friendly because I do know just look at me, six foot four, 360 pounds. I'm a, intimid a very intimidated guy when I'm just not talking. But when you get to know me, you realize how friendly I am. So from the outside, it could be very intimidating. A group of colors, descending <laughs> together, big, huge. <laughs> and like, oh my God, can I, I can't, can't. now I'm going this way. So I know that for us, we have to do a better job showing everybody, yo, okay, yes, we are gathering together for ourselves, all right, but we are inviting, we are friendly, we want you here, we need you here, because if anything is gonna push us forward, it's unity. Right. We can, uh, here. Uh, other people had their hand up first, so I'll, yeah. For me, I kind of look at that question, like, um, how people sometimes still ask, well, okay, there's a black entertainment television, where, where's the white one? Or there's Every black history, right. there's, <laughs> there black, there's black history month, where's the white one? Every other Okay, okay, when I watched television as a kid, seeing people my color was not the norm, it was an oddity. 
and I could tell even when it was in black and white. When I learned about history, when I learned about English growing up, I never heard the name Langston Hughes until February for some reason, and then all of a sudden, son, I tell you, life for me has never been no crystal stair. Thank you very much. Um, can you make us memorize that during Poetry Week? Oh, no? Just February. Okay. That's right. nice. <laughs> I mean, I was, it wasn't until I was in my 40s that I knew that there were heavy metal bands <laughs> out in Africa, the continent of Africa, in different African countries. In my 40s, I have been a metalhead since I'm 13. I'm not going to talk about how old I am now. Because <laughs> no. You're 41. <laughs> but the sh and and then I find out that there's there was a group called Death, you know, that was playing metal and punk in the seventies in Detroit. You know, I thought in living I thought Living Color was the first. No, wait second because Fishbone. No, wait third because Bad Brains. Right. What kind of? And I'm not even going to go into it. But yeah, that's why. That's why we need the Men of Onyx. That's why we need the Onyx Pearls. That is why. There's a hand back here. It's not a good one. I'm glad I went to a game in Love and Club, and we have been approached and scolded for having a gay and lesbian club. Sure. Mm -hmm. Pam. And okay, I just say. find it very disrespectful a straight person to come to me and say, why can't I be a full member of the club? Mm -hmm. Because you have all these others. Right. <laughs> right. And, right. Yeah, yeah, a gay and lesbian character. I, can, I get it. I get yeah. it on the intellectual level. Mm -hmm. you know, but, um, so thank you for saying that. I do, oh, I do Thank want you. to piggyback off of what you said, sir. And I, I respect what you're, what, where you're coming from in terms of um, approachability. However, I don't, I personally do not feel that it is our responsibility to be approachable. Any more so than it is any other human being's responsibility to be um, approachable because it's not my job to make you comfortable about my existence. And I really do get what you're saying. And, you know, because I mean, I do generally, you know, sometimes we, any of us can be unapproachable, but the assumption that just because a group of black people are standing around that we are automatically unapproachable is a problem. To say that you are unapproachable because you are 6'4 and 300, uh, 360. 360, and you know, that's one thing, but to automatically say that this little five foot two uh, black guy and this other one and these three, just because we have chosen to gather and we happen to be together in a group, um, that we are unapproachable is problematic. So, I mean, I get what you're saying, but I think those are two uh, separate issues. It goes back to me, I remember uh, when I was in college, um, this couple that I worked with uh, got robbed. And the guys that robbed them happened to be black. So they said, you know, they were trying to have like a serious moment. So, you know, I tried to be serious about it. And they said, well, you know, I'm scared now because every time I see a black person, I crawl one across to the other side of the street. I said, well, I get where you're going and I know that you are upset and everything, but I want you to break that down. You are living out some sort of a cultural stereotype of black people, whether you recognize it or not, because would you feel the same way if the person had robbed who had robbed you had been white? Would you now then cross the street in front of every other white person? No. That means that you have some sort of internalized fear about that. And as long as you don't confront that, then we will have a problem. And we didn't have a problem personally. I'm just saying that as long as that remains unconfronted, then uh, there will still be the need for us to gather in these spaces. 
Yeah, one thing that we've seen, um, and uh, it's piggybacking on your comment, um, is that we offer the invitation, but other people have to <laughs> accept the fact that they might be the other mm -hmm. when, when they, they the attend majority. the event. And how comfortable are they in being the other, or the being the minority in the room? Because um, they're not used to it. Because they're not used to it. And that's when you have to make it accountable for that. Right. I'm used to it. I live in America. <laughs> and I'm black. Um, so I'm used to going into those spaces, if not most of my life, part of my life because I did grow up in a black church and in a black Jewish, black and Jewish neighborhood, which again was transitioning. But um, I, you know, so, but college, there were 200 of us on a campus of 4,000, <laughs> you know, um, on campus, but of course other people in the city, but on campus. So I've had to get used to being the other and understanding and being taught by my family, by my mother, that you are going to be the other. And so therefore, this is, your, this is part of your life. And understand it and move forward with it. You had a couple of questions. You had a lady over there first. Lady. Uh, where was the head? Right over here. Here, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to give one person's opinion. Sure. I, sure. Um, back to the original question about how to get us coming to the POC events. Um, I run a fledgling women's, leather women's group mm -hmm. back home, and we have certain events that are women only, mm -hmm. um, female identified only. Then we have our bar nights that are open to everyone. Um, our entire community and we specifically put in our advertising open to all mm -hmm. um, just to clarify <coughs> and with the onyx events or the people of color events there are assumptions made and I guess on my part speaking for myself the assumption is if I were to ask I guess <coughs> in my mind there's a, a res, an assumption, a response sure. of what part of people of color do you not understand? You know, kind of. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So if there was, so that would keep me from even That's asking. Yeah. Um, Excuse me. So something yeah. like that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Let's go to Epic. So on a more basic level, I guess my, my question is, uh, for me, I'm, I'm here, I, I hear, I, thank you for sharing. Um, but on a more basic level, I guess for me, I would have to ask, so are there other POCs that you know? Are there other POCs that you are around? Um, and my, at first I was thinking, oh, well this is coming from someone, she, she may not have a lot of But if you do, then I guess I'm not making a connection with how you got to that point. Um, because I, I don't, I can't speak for every single member of, 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 of Onyx, but there's not one that I've ever met and granted cis like a male. So I, I can't, I, I just never got that assumption where you have to validate an event by saying open to all. If you're putting it out there in space or you know to advertise for an event, this is the event, this is the date, time, and place. Show up. But, but, I, but I, I, mean, I, I hear you. I guess it's just. I guess with with the women's group, why we do that open to all is because there are other female identified people out in our community that we might not know about, and we advertise it out there to let them know that this thing is happening. Mm -hmm. But we're not necessarily inviting everybody to this event. We are. Well, I mean, our bar nights, yes, but the women's specific events. Well, we don't want there to be any, you know, misunderstandings as far as what this is. So, actually, there's one other, there's one, like, even another piece of, like, of Onyx. When we talk about the Brothers of Onyx, um, 
these are male identified people. So, I mean, that was never something that we had to say. It, 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 but, but I think it's more of a, I, I, to her point, I think it's more of a marketing issue than anything because you, you can't unless you're targeting a specific neighborhood zip code or you're using those kinds of demographics to send out your marketing but that, that well, let me let me finish if you're putting it out there in the open uh, atmosphere and nobody for everyone to get then that means people are going to read it and the assumption would be made and it is an assumption and, and in order to clear up, clear up that assumption, you would need to be more specific saying it's open to everyone because if I saw something that came from a women's group, because I could get that because it's open in the marketing world, then I would assume it, it was for women unless it says something otherwise. And I think that's the same thing that goes on with our marketing is that, yeah, we know Bar Night is open to everyone, but we don't necessarily say that. And, and when we look at who actually shows up to Bar Night, it's mostly the black men, in our case, in South Southeast. So it, it may be more of a marketing issue in terms of being able to put that tagline of open to all or anyone's welcome, because you're, you're putting it out there and everyone's going to read it. And, and assumptions are going to be made based on the picture, the name, some of the other kind of but key things that are going to get your mind working in a certain direction. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. so, and so, go ahead. Can I just suggest, well, and you know, this will be something that right. we can talk about, particularly for our organization later, is that um, I hear you, and I hear you, particularly you, sir, because we had this conversation earlier, and I hear, I personally hear other people saying this, and I don't want to um, negate what you're saying by saying what you should have understood. We hear what you're saying, and I think it's something that we can talk about. And I can put myself a little bit in your shoes as a white person and saying that in a culture that is, where you are part of the majority, you do understand that every event is uh, for you. And when a person who was not part of your group posts something that you might not understand automatically, that you are welcome. In the same way that when we post events, well, of course everyone's welcome. But if you're not part of that group, in the same way that you, ma'am, you know, you host some events that are specifically for the LGBT community and some that are not. Well, if you're a part of that community, you know automatically that if you see that it's that this bar is going to be this group and you know the name of the group, you understand that. But if you're not, you're not part of it. So I just want to be clear that we do hear you and are not negating the, ex the lived experience that you have actually had. Thank you. Can we move to another piece of, sec of intersectionality? But yes. hold your questions because we, we do need those points. Jot them down um, so you don't forget them. Um, for those whose fetish is race play, <laughs> I heard of. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, when taken out of context, their play can be viewed as a hindrance to community efforts to eradicate or combat racism. How then can we support those in our community for whom race play is cons a consensual, <coughs> risk-aware fetish? Oh, okay. There we go. go this. We got I'll it right go this way. Right. I haven't Come said on. anything today. <laughs> 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 I yield okay. the floor to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mufasa forwarded us those questions, and so I did have some time to think about this, and um, I'm very glad that the question is here. Um, back in, the, in about 19, I think it was 91 or 92, I was doing a workshop with a woman named Midori mm -hmm. in um, San Diego. And those of you who don't know Midori, she's Japanese, she's gorgeous, she wears latex all the time, and that's dumb, that's sort okay. Of <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I was doing a workshop with her in San Diego, and the workshop was a negotiation workshop. And she was a dom, I was a sub, and we did a scene from start to finish, and it took about an hour and a half. We negotiated the scene in front of the class, um, we went through the scene and ended the scene with cuddling and all that stuff um, at the end of it. And the class 
could not interrupt us at all. That was, that was the parameters of it. But at the end, they got to ask questions. So someone said to me, what were you thinking about while you were being flogged? Because Midori flogs fairly heavily. So, um, and without thinking about it at all, I said, well, you know that scene in Mandingo where he, me, this on this, he's on a stage and he's going to be sold. And he's standing on that stage and he, to me, was the sexiest, hottest thing I had ever seen in my life. And I had only, I was probably like 14 at the time. And he was proud, <coughs> beautiful, strong, and all those things that I thought I was not. When you, if you were in last night's panel, I talked a lot about growing up being high yellow and thinking that I was not masculine and I was not beautiful because, you know, the people in my generation were looking at Shaft as, as their example of a hot black well, man. Yes. And then on the other side, you had Pam Greer, who was light-skinned, and that was me. And so <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was not masculine and I was not handsome. So in my mind, after I saw Ken Norton in that movie, that's who I wanted to be. Folks are still fanning. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even realized it, but when I subbed, I felt like the biggest, strongest, hottest, finest, most defiant black man ever. And that's what I thought about when Midori was flogging me. It felt like a connection to my past. And that was a connection that I had always wanted because I felt that I could not connect to people in Africa because I was high yellow. And that's what I was always told by my relatives. Mm. I couldn't, I was the light one in the family. So I wanted that connection. And finally, I had that connection. And that's what race play was to me. And we didn't call it race play because it didn't have a name. It was all in my head. And when I do a scene that I am subbing in that is as successful as I want it to be, it takes me to that place. That place where I am the strongest, fiercest black man ever, <clears throat> slave, whatever, I will overcome all of this. And that's where I am in those scenes. Now, I know a lot of people don't agree with race play, and I get it from all sides of being somebody who is a, a black female submissive who is willing to submit to a white man. And I get the self-hater from black people. I get white people who want to rescue me because they think I have low self-esteem and don't realize that I'm this beautiful black butterfly that all of they have to do is take my hand and show me that I don't have to submit to a white person that except them exactly mm -hmm. that except them because they will respect me better than the person that I'm with mm -hmm. that uh, it is the meaning in order to help someone who is a part of race play see it in the same way as you would any female submissive who is with a, a male dominant or a male submissive who is with a female top. That is a place that we've chosen to be. That is with our consent. That is with our knowledge of knowing what we are getting into. What you see on Tumblr and on porn of what race play is, that isn't what race play is to me and to many of us who do it. And it is like to me the ultimate kink shaming of saying, you hate your race. You are putting back what we have struggled to be seen as respected, intelligent human beings. The man that I serve willingly, yes, is white. But one of the things that he earned my loyalty is the day that he turned to me and said, I recognize you as a submissive, but I see you as my equal. 
he will always have my loyalty, even if we break up for those words. And when we ever do race play, it's generally in private, but when we do public scene, he lowers his voice so that only I can hear him because he knows how people are gonna to react to hearing me being called the names that they have been taught never to say. But in our black community, we can say in music all the time, nigger this, bitch that, and think it's perfectly fine. I want that kind of same respect from my people. If you can say that in song, I have every right to have somebody who is white to be able to say that to me because that is our love language that still has respect. No different than you have respect when somebody calls you a whore, a slut, or whatever name that they want to call you in degradation play. So be supportive of the people who you may not be able to understand why they do it, but respect them. Stop the people who are going to put them down because of it. I've even done a race play scene with a black man who happened to be darker skinned than myself. It shocked the hell out of everybody because they never thought that a race play scene could be between two black people. Okay, yeah. Guess so what? And I do apologize, no. No. but he's the field nigger. I was the house nigger. Yeah. Oh. That's, yeah. but we had such, when people realized what we were doing, by the time we were in, we ended our scene, they said that was one of the hottest scenes that they had ever seen between two consenting individuals. Even though it was racial slurs that we were giving back and forth to each other <coughs> that they had been taught from the time that they were little was wrong. Rick. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, the last part of your, your comment in terms of, uh, and, and both of you actually, that it's, it's the space that you're in as individuals. And I think that's the other thing that we really have to take into account is that everyone's individual and, and it's going to react differently. Uh, I think it also has to do with intent. I, I think there are definitely still very racist white people out there whose intent would not necessarily be that of consent and love and caring and respect, but one of wanting to uh, have that dominance over whether it's a male or female. And I think as part of the negotiation and the, the mind space that you're in with that person, you should be able to, to try and discern what's really going <coughs> on here. Um, but I think part of it is, is because you're individuals and you're doing your thing with another individual, I will respect you for making those choices and that you are intelligent and smart enough and brilliant enough to make choices for yourself. If I, I personally don't want to see it. So guess what? I can leave and not see it, but I will fight till the end for your right to be able to do it. And I think that is what makes a difference. I'm not going to criticize it. You know, we've got a lot of different types of shaming going on within the community now, which I, for the life of me, cannot understand. I came into it because of the experience. No matter what the kink, the fetish, the whatever it was I wanted to do, people are going to say, yeah, come on, we can do that. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. And now we're shaming people about being bottoms. And then, and this goes on and on and on about that. And I'm not going to shame you because that's what you like. What I am going to do is make my own choice of whether I want to be in the space with you mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to support you and I'm going to fight for you to have the right <coughs> to do what you want to do with whomever it is you want to do it. Let me have the last comment on this, and then we need to move on because there's three more questions. Get the, yeah, get, the question get the audience. Yeah, get the audience. Get the audience. So you can talk get, about get a, this all day. Get the last question from the audience, not uh, us. Let's go here. We haven't heard from you. You said about if you don't like the scene, it's within your right to leave it. Because usually, typically around race play, I hear a lot of times, like, well, I didn't consent to have that happening or to hear those words or to see that in my face. You're the public dungeon or wherever you might choose to do that scene. I guess quickly, I think this is funny we're talking about this, and I think the choice, like what Rick was saying, about like, do I want to see this? I think we all remember last year when that it was, a, was it International Leather Sir Boy contest, and they actually did that race play scene at the contest. Yes. <laughs> and 
Mm -hmm. That, I mean, because, you know, everyone's feeling with race plays. We very hear different. about those things. <laughs> you know, it, it's first. It's first. Yeah. And see, the problem. When it was going on, we heard it <laughs> came while, through. While it was happening. Yeah. <laughs> while it was happening. Literally. Yeah. Literally. It was just, it was really something. I mean, I've seen race play scenes, so I don't mind it. But at a contest, I personally wouldn't have done that kind of thing. And plus, the contest didn't alert the people that this kind of scene was happening. So that wasn't the so all right, I know we gotta move on. Right. But, uh, for me, it was Hot not topic. the issue that the right. two people involved wanted to do race play. Yes, it wasn't support. even it wasn't even that um, they chose to do it as their fantasy because you can do yeah. whatever fantasy it is that represents. It's that the issue of chattel slavery was played as a joke. Mm -hmm. And it was it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't between two people who were actually living out of fantasy. They were making fun, literal fun, of slavery, and mm -hmm. I was not fine with that. I was I had no problem. I have a slave, so and and that's completely different, you know, consensual master slave relationships versus chattel slavery. So my problem ev only ever was and only ever will be that they played the issue of owning someone as a joke. Plus, there was no forward. Uh, I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> there are people in our community, both black and white, who make a living at doming and subbing and that sort of thing. And a lot of times when you see race play being done on the internet or, you know, one of those sites, that's a performance. Mm -hmm. That they're, they're making money, that's how they make their living. They are performing for you. That is not race play. That is not play at all. You know, anyone can can perform any dungeon stunt as they as they please. Yeah, that's basic porn. What we do is I do porn too. But, <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> Last <laughs> one. <laughs> As a black femme dom, there will be people who want to create a race play relationship with you, assuming that if it's flattering, because you're an ebony goddess, that you should automatically participate. Mm -hmm. Forgetting that the race, so I, did, I wanted to highlight that it's not necessarily from someone who's acting as a top and demeaning. Mm -hmm. It can also be a white submissive saying, I want to be enslaved by an ebony goddess. Yes. Sure. Oh, sure. You are still fetishizing me and forcing me to be in your race play fantasy without my consent. Mm -hmm. Boom. Boom. Next question. <laughs> As we are at the table, Hot Topics table. Um, how can both POC and non-POC Male identified individuals make better efforts to learn how they contribute to misogyny and massage noir. Massage noir. Further, how can they provide safe spaces and equal opportunities to support their sisters? Okay, so first of all, <laughs> why y'all haven't already? <laughs> first of all, we need you to listen. Notice I did not say hear. I said, listen. In other words, when we bring you a concern, don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Don't dismiss it. Don't fall asleep while we're talking to you. Actually listen. Listen. That is the biggest thing. Second, please do not treat the female identified Organiz leather organizations as the ladies auxiliary at the church. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. I'm sorry. Say it. But we, are <laughs> <laughs> we are not here to pick your brownies. We are not. I mean, but if you make it, I'm messing with you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I took away from your series. <laughs> but yeah, we're not the ladies auxiliary. We're 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 not going to bake your brownies. We're not going to babysit. We're not going to run your car wash. When we're talking about doing fundraising, we're talking about some real shit. All right. Just as an example, the house tray, twelve hundred dollars last week. 
raise $1,200. Now that's a badass bitch right there running a badass house. Other comments? I think oh, as, as <laughs> people... <laughs> Wait a minute. I think as as men of color and being raised in I was raised in a black household in a very, very black neighborhood and the disrespect that my friends and relatives have for our women is appalling and disgusting to me. And I think as black men, especially gay black men, we need to be aware when the women around us are being disrespected by other men and we need to step in there and do something about it. That's what we are. We, we, we're still men. And these are still our sisters. And I'm not saying they need our protection, right. but we need to do our part in making sure that they're not disrespected. And we can't disrespect, disrespect them ourselves. So, I mean, just the other day, I was having a 90s moment. So I pulled up <laughs> all of the music that I listened to in college and I was listening to it from a 2018 perspective. I was like, this be, I was like, damn, I can't listen to any of this shit anymore. <laughs> this is terrible, not terrible, terrible music. And it was just, you know, and you know, I certainly don't think that I treated the women in my life um, differently, but I think it does have some sort of a effect when you, when that is, all that you hear so I think we have to do more than just give lip service to the idea we as you were saying Graylin you know we have to actively manage this you know even it's you know it's even as simple as you know calling you know people bitches you know I mean I don't know. some 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 things are so ingrained <laughs> but you know if people don't want to be called that then you respect that, right. you know. Yeah. If if don't use um, terms of uh, do, don't use derogatory term derogatory terms for women to identify other men. So you know, um, there's not anything wrong with being a man who may be more feminine identified. Don't demean the female, and to be active in thinking about that and be intentional in our language and our actions and our relations to our sisters. I know I tend to talk over people all the time and I'm, I'm working on that, I really am. <laughs> but I remember... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know that in our workplaces, the voices of, our, uh, of, of the women in our workplace as hard as her because I remember there were several women that worked for me and I used to just sit back and watch how when we were in meetings um, since I was the manager I just didn't really have anything to say I was watching other people talk and the women would start talking and a man would start talking over her just mm -hmm. automatically to start talking over her and even at some sometimes on leather events and panels and other things the women will start talking and the men will just start talking over and it's not that they are actively trying to demean but it's just so ingrained about that till it's something that you as a man have to actively I'm going to use the word police. We're going to we have to actively police this in ourselves so that the women in our lives, I mean, you talk about the problems that we have as people of color, but you know, there's a whole ton of shit that I understand I know that women go through and they have to deal with in their lives and sometimes I hear women, you know, when they when they feel like you can accept like the real truth about all of the shit that they deal with and you know all of that space. I'm like, wow, I just I can't even fathom going through life with just some of this shit that y'all have to go through. So we have to do better. We have to actively police ourselves and each other. And if you're not careful you fail to police yourself at the wrong place at the wrong time, and you will run into somebody like me who will police it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Comment here. We haven't heard from you. I want to thank Daddy Rod, and I'm going to do it publicly, because I ran a group discussion for women on massage day last year mm -hmm. at the Atlanta Eagle. It was Daddy 
Rudd offered up the space, and it was controversial. So a couple of things I'm going to add to what you said is don't change the subject to talking about men and male space when the discussion is about women. And don't get angry when we gently try to, you know, this is not the place. <laughs> don't talk over us and get your panties in a bond. And don't get angry when we bring up issues and we just want to be heard. That happens. And a gentleman just began talking about men. And uh, I got a lot of flack and I suspect Daddy got to do But it was a good conversation and a needed conversation. It was a needed conversation. Thank you. Here. I was just going to say that this seems to go back to one of the answers given to the first question, mm -hmm. where we we're talking about how can non POC organizations and people support POC advocating for them, even when nobody's present, is essentially what a lot of you seem to be saying. Only now we're talking about women. Yes. Mm -hmm. and obviously, that should be a pretty clear answer. Anyway. Thank you. And supporting our sisters by attending events like IMSL. Yes. You know. yeah. Onyx will have the first dance at IMSL. First Onyx dance at IMSL. April 20th. April 20th. San Jose. This year in San Jose. Yeah. Um, we have uh, working with the Onyx Pearl Southeast. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is 420. So, I didn't make that. It is 420. Anyhow. And it's legal in California. Last two questions. <laughs> Thank you all. How can leadership boards and organizations improve diversity and equality among all races? Repeat that again. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. How can leadership boards and organizations improve diversity and equality among all races? Pick qualified people of color to serve on those boards. But once again, like I said earlier, do not treat the people of color that you're picking to serve on these boards as Pokemon. Once again, your name is not Ash Ketchum and your job is not to catch them all. And to, um, if you, so, so let's say you do find, you know, this person of color or this, uh, wo this woman of color, or this, uh, person of color, uh, to be on this board or in the organization, they're not there as a token to fill a space. They're there because they, a vital role needs to be filled. So, you know, give them the responsibility of, of being um, uh, a, vital part of a, a, a vital part of the organization. And to right. piggyback off what Graylin said last night, if they say they pick an African-American man or woman, we don't speak for every black person. Exactly. Right. Because right. we all have very, very tastes and everything else. So. Mm -hmm. It behooves you to have a diverse mm -hmm. of everything. So. What also I found is that um, many leaders in our community, um, in, say the people of color community, and I'm speaking uh, well, the people of color community, I'll speak that way. Um, I've seen burnout um, <laughs> around leader, being a leader in the community and supporting boards and being on boards because sometimes you're asked to fill multiple seats and in different places and when we feel that we're not being heard um, and get and we're most likely outvoted mm -hmm. uh -huh. in every way based upon the ideas that we bring to the table when that ceases to be part of who we are and ceases to speak to our soul we tend then to move on. And many then have moved on to causes within our own community mm -hmm. where then they know that there is, they, they will be heard a little, bit, a little bit more. And it reaches into our souls and sensibility of who we are. And that can be seen from the outside looking in as giving up or you know, not caring about the community or as such, but it's not so. It's caring about 
a different segment of the community where our efforts may be, where more effort may need to be because no one is taking care of that community. So a lot of, I've seen a lot of, a lot of people opt out of boards because they feel that they will not be heard. Right, and it's part of, again, you know, give those people, give those that you invite to the board a vital role and be prepared to hear and understand that their <coughs> issues are legitimate. Because if you are just accepting a person because you have a spot to fill for a woman and a spot to fill for a, a man, then, you know, whatever. It's that episode of you know, the Cosby Show where uh, Claire is invited to participate on the panel. Oh, yeah. And she was I thought I was invited because I was a well-respected lawyer. It was like, no, you were invited because you were black and you will speak on the black issues and the black, black issues woman. only. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so yeah, people don't want to be um, put into those pigeonholes and they will put their efforts into spaces where they're respected. Go ahead. Oh, the, the biggest fight I'm having in San Francisco right now is with a woman who proposed to a board that's forming there now that a seat on that board be reserved for a person of color. And my response was, what are you gonna do until a person of color wants to fill that board seat? Is it gonna just sit there vacant? And then how's the voting gonna take place? How's this gonna work? And she didn't call me a racist, which was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> um, because that was a racist statement because me asking that question meant that I don't like black people or don't like colored people or something, but I don't want a, an empty board seat there. And I don't want people of color to think we have to go fill that board seat because now they are holding that for us. And whether we want to or not, we have to fill that up. So that was my, my first question. Then my second question to her was, how are you going to identify the people of color? And the chair said, because it's San Francisco, uh -oh. we'll <laughs> go by self-identification. And to explain that, if you identify as a person of color in San Francisco, therefore you are. So, so Rachel Dole was on. And I was called the racist. And, and it's still an argument that I'm having to this day with this person that they can't hold a seat on the board for a person of color because they can't form any guidelines around that. Although I want a person of color to be on that board, I know for a fact that none of us want to be because as you said, we are burnt out. We can't be on every board. It's only like five of us who are doing anything anyway. So I just... <laughs> And, and by the way, I'm doing a workshop on burnout tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at yeah, 11.30. Yeah, yeah. So I am doing that workshop. <laughs> Last comments. Thank you all. I want a closing statement from uh, the, the six of you, one, two, three, seven of you up here. Um, and just, um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, we could continue on these things. We just hit the surface. But we are open to talking about any of these subjects at any time and are available on the internet and through any of the Onyx organizations um, across the country. We often teach on these subjects because we are educate, we want to educate. We are calling each other to educate and empower each other. So it's not just for the community, it's for us because we need it as people of color within the community as much as we need to educate the community. So we educate each other. We have Onyx Teach, which is, an organ which is our uh, national uh, educational initiative. Um, and it, there are classes in there for us as brothers, internal classes, but there are also community classes as we instruct and teach others um, about things. 
it's as simple as me going to flogging classes for years where no one who taught the class ever mentioned flogging a person of color. And I'm in the class. So what do you do when you do that? When I can't see Dominion's skin turn red. Make him bleed. I can bleed. <laughs> Those are issues that we deal with. Those are real life issues that we deal with on the table. So I, in the class, have to raise my hand and say, well, when I'm playing with another man of color, this is what I look for. The instructor has never played with a man of color before. So I don't expect them necessarily to know from experience, but if you're teaching a class as such, that should be something that is in your wheelhouse. But we move forward together. Uh, Onyx is 23 years old this year. And we thank you for supporting us and all that we've done and all that we do across the country. Um, thank you for the award this weekend. Um, it really touches our hearts that we are being recognized for being a part of the community and being leaders in the community. Thank you all for being here. We have. Uh, uh, evaluations. Our evaluation person <laughs> is going to talk to us and bring forth the benediction. <laughs> Wait, where's the altar call? The altar call is up here. They will accept you all. <laughs> they will lay hands up here if you do come up here. <laughs> Promise. Thank you all. <laughs>